Proverbs chapter 27, verse 7, reading. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but the hungry soul, every bitter thing, is sweet. Let's read one more time. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. May God bless the reading of His Word to our souls. Now, when a person is so full that even a good thing is of no interest to the person, you can put before this person who is feeling very full the very most delicious, most nutritious thing before him. Well, this passage says, such a person will actually loathe, loathe even the very good thing. Now, a full soul is someone who does not feel hungry. For example, in a physical sense, it will not matter to this person whatever you offer to him. He wants to have no part of it. Now, this is why the man, he, he loathes it, he dislikes it. Now, even though the thing is sweet, even though the thing is very important for his health, he is too stuffed to enjoy anything. Now, but God says there is an opposite situation. And here, there is the hungry soul. In contrast, for the hungry soul, now he is famished. He desires food even If it is bitter food, he is no longer picky. Whatever is placed before him, he readily and happily partakes of it. Now even to the extent that even if the food were bitter to most people, this hungry soul would actually find it sweet. He will take it up, he will eat it, He will be grateful for anything that will help in his hunger. This is the picture that is painted before us. Now, what is honeycomb? Well, I tried to read up. I always wondered about, you know, people eating honeycomb. Why, why do, why do they sell, why not just sell honey? And then you sell the honeycomb uh, with the honey. Uh, People seem to like to buy that, eat that. Now, I didn't realize that after the bees fill the hives, you know, those, those hives, the hexagonal part, when they fill each slot, they will cap it with a thin layer of beeswax. Beeswax, that's what I put on my lips. Right? Beeswax is so dry. So they will cap it with, with this beeswax. Now, the aim is to protect that nectar in it. But the problem is this, when men harvest it, all right, what they do is they extract this honey in it by removing the cap. And in most cases, the honey is then heated, processed, but the resulting product is we actually strip off the nutrition, nutritional and beneficial substances from that original state. So like the pollen, propolis, and, and royal jelly, and so on. So, but with the honeycomb in its, in its original state, you get the honey still kept in the cell, full of its, well, this, this person says, this article says, full of the bee-made goodness, all right? Bee-made goodness. The unbelievers was the God-made goodness. So to them, that's the situation. Now, honey, with the honeycomb, especially when it is intact and it's, it's in the original um, state. Now, raw honey is very rich. It's a very rich source of, of um, phenols and other antioxidant compounds. It has both protective as well as promotive qualities. Now, when people who have high blood, uh, sorry, um, yeah, when they have blood pressure problems or 
um, um, maybe diabetes, it says honeycomb won't spike your blood sugar. That's how wonderful it is. It is, well, several studies have proven that raw honey can lower bad cholesterol, raise good cholesterol. Well, maybe some doctors here may disagree, but people who sell honey, they study and they say, yeah, that's what they find. And even the, the honeycomb itself can be eaten, chew it. Some people don't like it, but they say even within there, um, you can extract long chain fatty acids and, and so on and so forth. Now, not only that, it, it protects, it protects the liver, protective properties. Raw honey eases cold and allergy symptoms. Raw honey, with a honeycomb especially, supports immune system. Um, is good for gut health. It's, it promotes better sleep. Now, many of us seem to be having sleep problems, right? Well, take some honey, according to this article. But many, many um, good properties in this unadulterated, unmixed, untreated form. So many forms of vitamins in there, right? And these vitamins are in its best state. So here, the Lord does not just say honey. But he says, honeycomb, honeycomb. Now I begin to understand why very often in the Bible, it's not just honey. I thought honey is good, right? Maybe now when you call your wife, you don't call honey anymore. Honeycomb. <laughs> in the best state, honeycomb. So wife, if your husband calls you honey, call me honeycomb. <laughs> right? I'm the best for you. The Lord chose me for you. <laughs> honeycomb. Now I begin to understand in that state, the best state. Now, then, now for those people in those period, they understand these things better than us, I guess. And when they read honeycomb, they know that God is talking about something in its in its best form that is very good for them. So when they read it, they say, "Whoa, wow!" When a fool, when a person is full, sees even honeycomb with all the knowledge, with all that, see, and you just ah. Uh, don't feel like partaking of it. Now we want to try and learn some things from this passage. May God help us to. We've looked at detrimental emotions that will affect our spiritual life. We saw the beneficial choices that we should make when it comes to open rebuke. The beneficial choices that we need to make in order to help us to improve, to grow spiritually. Well, today we see particular necessary hunger. Necessary hunger that we need to have in order to keep growing. Not just keep growing. Honeycomb, as we've read, they are protective. Not just promotive, protective usefulness in it. Now, most people say, well, don't go hungry. Hungry means it's a sign that it's not good. Eat. In some culture, whenever they meet people, the first thing they ask, have you eaten? Right? So some people from other culture, they find it very strange. Why do these people keep asking me whether I've eaten? Right? So to them, being hungry is not a good thing. Right? You should be full always. But here, God's Word says the opposite. There is a particular hunger, a kind of hunger. It is good to have that hunger, a kind of fullness that is not good. Now, Christians, as we desire to grow, this is an area that we need to really ask ourselves. What is the state of, or the spiritual state of my soul in terms of both being, feeling full as well as feeling hungry? Now, first and foremost, let us look at the dangers of this kind of fullness, the dangers of them. Obviously, when God makes a, uh, a statement, but, right? So, there is this state that is not good, but this state is better, is good. So, there are dangers. The full soul, lotheth and honeycomb. Well, this condition of fullness, the danger is of this full appetite. We'll look at a few Ds. 
there is a disinterest, a disinterest in the milk and the meat of the word. Spiritual things, affections for spiritual things are absent. Now this is especially a sign of someone who is not saved. We constantly remind in the church if you are if you have no interest in God's word that is not a good sign someone who is dead physically you can put his favorite food around the nose all right the person just won't respond the best food no response so for those of you who have been in church for a long time this is always a pastor's greatest fear are you truly saved are you sitting there and every time it's just I'm, I just go with my family and then once I'm there I switch off all right I'm there to just support my family be there because my parents expect me to be there but even for the believer even for the believer there can be this kind of disinterest disinterest when the Word of God is preached, we have to push ourselves, I, I should be interested. But the natural inclination, something has happened to us along the way. When we were first saved, we, were, we had a lot of interest. Something has come in that makes us less and less interested. You may not have no interest at all. So it's a dangerous state. You see, this sign of a full soul, someone who is walking past very, very nutritious and important and good food, that person knows it, and he walks past and just like nothing, a friend would look at it, I think there's something wrong with this, with this person today or now. So it is also, the second day, a sign, a possible sign of a diseased soul. See, this fullness is not a good sign, that this interest is not a good sign. And maybe because the soul has some sickness there is some spiritual disease that is that has come in that may be growing spreading some leaven now typically a sick person has no appetite isn't it true so God says a full soul looks at good things no appetite in the spiritual sense when you begin to feel that, you know, it's waning, my, my interest in God's word, my desire for spiritual things is not what it used to be. My first love is, is God. It seems to be very, very um, shallow now. Well, I'm a full soul. Is there some disease? I need to start to search my heart. Go to a friend. Can you give me some open rebuke? <laughs> I'm concerned. I'm worried. Now, this is a sign of spiritual danger. Sign of spiritual danger. Don't take this lightly. You know, as a Christian, after many, many years and so on, we sometimes think, uh, I think there's nothing wrong. It's, it's just like that. Everyone goes through that kind of life. I've shared many times when I first became a Christian, I looked up to many of my older brothers in Christ, older brothers in Christ. Some of them, over time I noticed that they, they seem to lack interest in the Word. And then I asked one when I was very young, as a very young Christian, I asked this person whom I looked up to a lot. Um, he used to conduct Bible studies for us in, in the school and so on. And I asked, you know, how is it that I seem to think that you're, 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 you've changed, open rebuke, eh? but then it's not so, so savvy. And he simply said, you know, Joseph, um, don't, don't worry. It's like that. You know, as you grow, grow as a Christian, most Christians become like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's normal. It's normal. I was a bit troubled, but I thought it would be so. But see, God would say it's not normal. There is something wrong. We should worry. And then another D. Loath. So the, the, the fullness should make us worry that, that there is some disease there. 
But it's not just simply disinterest. Loath, God said they were loath. Dislike it, hate it, look down on it. Now it's like, this loath is like description, like a traveller, very full, walking, and then looks, see some honeycomb on the floor. It could be maybe some, some animals have taken it from the tree, ate part of it, disinterested, throw it on the ground. And then walking, this traveller walking past and just say on the ground, uh, uh, no, no space to, to walk, just step on it and then keep moving. It's the word is like trample. Just step on it, like nothing. Step and walk over it. And look, uh, so dirty. Eee. Dirty my shoe. I don't like this. When someone who would normally say, wow, this is, what, what, what a find. So great. But now, seems to find it loathsome. Have we, oh, this is one of the danger. Now, have we over time begin to feel, ah, yeah, you know, got to go for camp. But, got to go, right? Just go, but uh, just waiting for, for the fun part, waiting for the fellowship part, waiting for the outings, waiting for the games. Yes, the Bible study part is, is loathsome to me. Not just dislike, no, just wish it's shortened. Now, Reverend Quack, when he preaches, he always asks, how long? What time should I stop? I say, just keep preaching. It's okay. Then one night he finished longer and said, oh no, sorry, I exceeded by, by 20 minutes. I said, don't worry. You know, now I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> that you, you all don't find it loathsome. I remember I kept thinking, you know, why, why is it that, that it's so? Um, so I told him, I think it's because of this. Most of you who attend camps, you are in the so-called preaching to the choir, right? Most of you take FEBC courses, and each course is two hours, correct? So you see, through, through two hours, even for your children, they're like, wow, one hour, pretty good deal, <laughs> right? So maybe it's that, but have we actually, maybe some of us begin to find it loathsome? Not just dislike, but it is, it is not just disinterested, it's loathsome. This loathsome is, I feel no need for it. I'm, you know, when someone is full, someone is full. Have you experienced this? When you're so full that, that the restaurant says, oh, you know, this dessert is very good. I say, oh, that is actually my favorite dessert in this restaurant. I love this, 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 this particular dessert. But at that time, just the thought of that dessert makes you want to puke, right? Just the thought of the dessert, oh, oh, you know, I don't want it. You begin to find that it's loathsome. So you see, there are danger signs, my friends. If you have come to a stage where some of these things are happening to you, God says, danger, danger. Now then, what are some of the reasons for this? Say, so, oh, I'm beginning to recognize some of these things. But why, what has happened? Why, why is this happening to me? Now, we look at a few C's, all right? God uses the word fool, the fool soul. You learn about the fool's wrath, but this is fool, all right? This different fool, fool soul. Fullness denotes complacency, the first C. Complacency is one of the reasons for spiritual satiation, all right? I tried to look for a word that, that describes it best. It's like a person who is satiated, all right? Maybe the younger ones, when you copy S-A-T-I-A-T-E, S-A-T-I-A-T, satiate, satiated, all right? Means it's, it's yeah, abundance of it and it's, oh, I'm s enough, well, to the brim, okay? Overflowing, satiated, my soul, satiated. Well, the reasons for spiritual satiation very often is complacency. I know enough already. I know enough. I heard that before. And a common one is, now what is the point of knowing God's Word in detail? 
Just tell me, just make the point and then move on. Why all the details? Now remember this honeycomb and the honey with the honeycomb is full of nutrients, so many kinds of vitamins in there, all right? They say, in fact, that many of those vitamins, they exist in the best state in there. All the details within there, just a little hexagonal um, spot. There are a lot of things in there that are beneficial. But the complacent soul will typically roll the eyes. Ah, there, ah, that again. Just tell me Jesus is God. In BBK, why must we spend 40 minutes talking about all the verses about Jesus is God, proving them and, and, and showing us the attacks of Jesus? You see, the soul is full. I'm a Christian already. The complacency is, I'm going to heaven, right? I'm going to heaven. I don't need to know all these details. The part about I know enough is, is a problem as we age as a Christian. Right? I know enough. Very often when we encourage people who hardly come for Bible studies, hardly come for fellowships, when we encourage them, the very common answer is, uh, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time. All these things I heard before, you know, nothing new. In fact, Pastor, I can tell you more. Right? So an elderly person literally told me that. I looked at the wife next to him. The wife kind of went like that. <laughs> so the only thing I figured is they probably had this conversation at home hmm? and said, there he goes again very complacent are you like that over time now, I believe many do not come for Bible studies because they feel that an everyday Christian a lay person a lay person does not need to know all this why do you ask me to take Bible college classes? They are for full-time workers. I'm an ordinary lay Christian, right? Everyday Christian. That is why I think um, Reverend To, Reverend Timothy To, and uh, Dr. Ku very well and aptly um, labeled the book. Is it theology for every? Christian, right? Theology for every Christian. For a long time, I, I forgot the name. You know why? Because it's the $10 book, right? In church, we refer it to the $10 book. And uh, I call it the $10 book because some, we tend to think in terms of money. So it's only $10, two cups of coffee, right? Cheaper than your, your, your McDonald's meal. So I call it the $10 book. So people say, oh, just $10. At least to incent you to, at least to buy it and start reading. So after some time, I really, I, I forgot what it's called. Theology for every Christian. Every, every day. Don't be complacent. It's for everyday Christians. Read it. Grow in these details. It's important. Another reason for spiritual satiation, which is dangerous for the soul, is carnality. Carnality. Some fleshly appetites have crept into our lives and now we find that spiritual things, you know, there's enough of these spiritual things, there's so much more in life, so much more in this particular thing, this particular area. Earthly things, carnal, just fleshly, may not be sinful. Not necessarily sinful. It could be a hobby, it could be an activity, it could be something that has changed. In your, you move to another stage of life, from singlehood to marriage, or into retirement, whatever it is. Maybe for the singles, you change jobs, right? Something has come in. But the carnal part of it, the fleshly part of it, fleshly things can be used for God, but this carnality is for self. It has become about self. Now he has overtaken. These carnal desires have overtaken what used to be your spiritual desires. Be very careful. You know, one of the things that I find at Chalet Fellowships, at least the ones that I go to, 
one of a common conversation that keeps coming up is this instant noodles <laughs> instant noodles every every chalet instant noodles but one chalet broke the record all right chalet how many packets I think 20, 30 packets of instant noodles. So, oh, this one breaks the record. <clears throat> Not to the point where some of our food is quite good, right, at this camp. But when you talk about instant noodles, they're more excited than the food that was good. Something else seems to be more, more exciting. Now, let me ask you, um, the food with the meat and vegetable in it and all that, and instant noodles. Which one is healthier? I know the young people say instant noodles. <laughs> That's what has become. What it has become. Something has now become something something, something can't it taste better to you now. That is why you feel full. Healthy food now is something even disagreeable to you. Our first um, second fellowship, this group of preteens and young teens came into our room. They brought many packets of potato chips. No, not potato chips, but all sorts of chips. Chips, corn chips, potato chips, different kind of chips, right? Chips. Came in the chips and off. Dinner was late, right? You know, uh, some of the nice dinner was late. So they were very, I started to rip it apart. I said, hey, we, we're going to have dinner. Then they say, oh, no problem, no problem. I say, no, if, if you eat this, you are going to lose your appetite. Right? Parents always say that. And some of these kids are there, not with, without the parents. Say, You're going to lose your appetite if you take this. No, 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 no. We will eat dinner. Promise. You will eat dinner. I say, all right, then you promise. So you must finish your dinner. Yes, 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 don't worry. Well, then all sorts of things. You're not just chips. Well, so exotic dips and all that. Wow, these pre-teens, they know about all sorts of dips that I've never heard before. Wow, dips and then chips. And then constantly, you know, they, some don't think that we're watching. Another one, another one. Then they look at that, look at it. Ship is green and lean back again. And then finally, dinner comes. Do you think they finished the food? Pasta, very hung, very full. <laughs> very full, right? Some carnal thing that went into us has now made us, made us no, have no relish, no appetite for the proper thing anymore, right? But the amazing thing is this, you know what I'm going to say, <laughs> after dinner, can I finish? I, I'll eat this tomorrow, promise, right? I'll bring it back, okay? Should ask the chalet lady, did they bring it back and eat the next day? I'll bring it back. And then after that, after dinner, we are talking. Then on the di on the on the hall side, <laughs> sound of the chips back again. <laughs> Suddenly, not full already. You eat, you eat. You see, the relish for honey, good things, has been replaced, and now you have that. Your your hunger is actually for these carnal things. That is why there is a spiritual satiation. Right? But when it comes to the carnal thing, can never saturate you, never saturate you, never satisfy you. It goes on. Now then, that is the next C. Now, God said, the fool, you are complacent. Now, loatheth, we come back to this word, loatheth. All right, the soul has carnality in it, right? Now, loath, loaths. Contempt, see, contempt. Contempt. Tired of the word. Why so long? Why so detailed? The contemptuous thoughts come in. Like I told you, now this word is, is also has a picture of trampling. You trample on something because you don't think much of it, right? Sometimes you do that because you have contempt for it. Now you can't run away. God uses the word. God chose to use the word loath. We have to face that. We have to face that. There is 
a loathsome disease that is in me that makes me loathe the way the word of God now. I need to be honest about myself now. Well, the whole problem of complacency is now you begin to not appreciate what you have, right? This contempt, I will use the term that the world, um, the phrase that the world comes up with. Familiarity breeds contempt, isn't it? Familiarity breeds contempt. Abundance of good things that now your soul says, ah, it's always there. Or you, you even, it's so familiar, so, so much good teachings in the BP movement. So many Bible studies in church. So many opportunities to learn God's Word. Uh, Uncle Mark, trying to do promotion for FEBC now. This is the time, right, people to, to sign up. We have all this. We begin to have contempt for them. I think parents, you can understand that very well. Before I say it, teens are laughing, smiling already. You have lots of good food on your table. Yeah, your mom is a very good cook. We have many wonderful, almost just the word cookers, <laughs> many wonderful um, um, housewives that cook wonderful meals. Sometimes when I come to your house, you invite me and you say, wow, this is very nice and so on. I'm not saying Sharon don't cook nice food. Huh? Sharon's food is very good as well. Um, but then I say, wow, this is very nice, this is very nice. And sometimes my heart, but home food is nice too. Familiarity, right? But it's different than excited. Then I'm excited, but the children are, no, mommy, I don't want that. I don't want this. I don't want that. And I said, wow, these this children are very unappreciative. Take all these things for granted. These are good food, very interesting food. Now, it becomes like that. When we have so much good teachings in the BP movement, people come from other churches. They are so hungry, right? Things that to many of you are basic. To them, when they leave, they say, you know, we've never heard about that. Never known about that. In my heart, when I was preaching that, I was thinking, I know the people say, ah, you know, we, we know that already. And I try to give more details to help you learn more. But I always worry that you just that part alone, then the rest you switch off already because we know that. Our YouTube ministry, and I thank God for that. I'm not, I don't say this um, to praise our YouTube ministry, but I say this to help us realize how we have we can have we have become actually so familiar we we take all these things for granted people who log in from europe from other places one wrote in broken english all right they don't even understand english properly but they found bbk they found teachings about the new evangelical movements and all that to say ah we can we can regurgitate to you all these things they can't even understand English that well, but see, we, we don't get this kind of teaching here. Reverend Craig was sharing out of this COVID-19, and there is something so exciting to my heart. Friends, church friends, church invite their friends who can't worship to log in with them, since everyone's stuck at home, they don't have live stream, they log in and then listen to them, it's like, whoa, no. Rain coming down on a very, very dry soul, so thirsty, so hungry. To the point where, when now things return to normal, they say, okay, now we return to normal, some of these things will, 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 will cease, continue with the other normal. And they will even write and beg, can you please don't stop it? Can you please don't stop it? Then I wonder in my heart, the members in the church, when they hear, all right, now we are going back to the old normal, all right? This extra new normal you know, is, is over. I wonder how some feel, maybe some will say, ah, we wish we had this lesson reduced. But those, they really treasure it. Now, BPCWA worshippers, search your heart. Have you become like that as your teens? Maybe you have become like that as well. You're beginning to be 
to take all these things for granted. I want to go to my friend's church. Why? Because there's so much fun there, so much of these other activities there. I was just Bible study. There are people who yearn to have Bible studies. Parents who bring their teens and say, I wish, you know, our church will have Bible studies for the children. But here, we take all these things for granted to the point where we may feel contemptuous about it. So teens, know that God says, a full soul loathes. This is familiar to you now, you loathe it. Good things, good things. Now we always pray, Lord, forgive us for taking these things for granted. Please don't take it away. Until it is taken away, then we begin to say we were too familiar. God forgive us, but it's no more there. We used to take the ability to fellowship in person for granted, right? I was very thankful that the moment the barriers were lifted, we could return to church. We had some problems getting people to go home. That's good. Why? Because suddenly what was familiar was taken away. Then when he came back, then we began to appreciate it. Correct? That is what happens. The full soul loves a good thing. Now we'll be having some children um, crying, talking. Parents are not saying it's bad, all right? We are very glad through all the difficulties you stay on. I'm sure the rest of the congregation uh, feel the same way, you know. But I wonder, you know, at least I hear the children. They are awake. <laughs> how many of us, how many of the adults are awake? No, I'm not saying adults, please purposely make some noise so that we know you're awake, right? How many of us are awake? It's so familiar, just actually dozing. Well, even if you're awake, really, are you really awake? Really? The full soul loves, finally contemptuous. Now, I told Reverend Quike when he first came, I say, yeah, please preach, you know. Um, in fact, I left many of the topics free to him. I say, give me the topics, all right? And, and we were having some conversations and I told him, you know, that is how the pastor's life is. Some foreign minister, they say the same things. They say the same things as the resident pastor. But somehow, the congregation, because they're so familiar with their own pastor, but a foreign minister say the same thing. Maybe even in less details. After that, I was like, wow, you know, wah, wah. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I have no jealousy. I, I told him, just preach, you know. As long as you learn, as long as you grow, I don't care who you learn it from. If, if familiarity with me makes you not learn, and then someone else you learn, that is the whole aim of church. But please don't misunderstand me. Pastor said, green light. All right, as long as pastor, we switch off, right? We wait for foreign people. I'm not saying that at all. But that is how we are, familiar. Same with, with children. I think one of the things that frustrates parents very often that I hear is this. You know, my children, I tell them and tell them. They won't listen. Then they come back, they say, you know, my friend said that. Then we say, but I told you the same thing. Going, my friend said, because parents, very familiar. The droning sound, <laughs> right? The familiar droning. Maybe I should speak in a different, different uh, tone, <laughs> then it's no more droning, right? Now, but all these jokes in the illustration aside, spiritual saturation is something that is dangerous and we have to examine what has made me become like that. When I sit there, I seem to be saturated, but I'm in a church that have many Bible studies, that does its best to teach the Word of, the word of God sound, that goes through details. Why am I like that? Is it, is it this familiarity that now I loathe? I loathe good things. Now what is the solution then? What is the solution? Some C's again. Now God says the full soul. Check your soul. Check your salvation. I mentioned briefly in the beginning. Check your salvation. 
You've been attending church for a long time, been there, done that, heard that many times since I was young, but nothing seems to thrill your heart at all. Is it because you are not saved? This is one of the signs. Parents, if you see your children, they go through all the motion, but in family worship, there don't seem to be any um, interest. Teens, you attend family worship, you come to church simply because you're forced to. It's a very serious thing. The thematic message have emphasized many times about genuine salvation. If not, it's eternal, eternity in hell. Same for the adults as well. Now, my friends, if you still have, you have heard the gospel many times, you come to camp with us many times, but you still say, I have no interest. Pray to God, God, I need to be saved. I think when I think about this, I look at my wife, my children, but I'm not like that. Please save me. Wash away my sins. Forgive me. Cry to God. Check your salvation. A full soul that is like that is a dangerous soul. State. Now, the next C. The next C. Now, God says the hungry soul. How do you cultivate this hungry soul? Right? The solution is to cultivate a hungry soul. The C is cultivate a hungry soul. You find that your love for the law, your love for spiritual things, your love for especially the Word has become so familiar, you, you, you are taking all these things for granted and no more relish. The appetite is gone. It can be cultivated. It needs to be cultivated. All right? That is why God gives all these things to tell us, you need to be hungry. So how to cultivate hunger? This morning when we were having breakfast, um, the conversation was about eating chili, right? Eating chili. So you know I stay with the Lu's, all right? I've never stayed with them before, so it's my first time staying with them. So I want to know about, about family more. And I said, oh, then how did you come to like chili? Because uh, Sister Grace is from Taiwan, right, originally. Um, so she said, I never liked chili. But you know, my husband likes chili. So I make chili. Now after I eat, after some time, I say, oh, actually, it's quite nice. It's quite nice. All right, before that, the daughters, the, one of the daughters said, I love Indian food. I said, wow, that's interesting, you know. Young, young teenager love Indian food. I said, how did you come to like Indian food? I said, I never knew there were different kinds of food. <laughs> You know, when you're young, food is food on the table, eat. Then one day, brought to Indian restaurant, oh, Indian, this is Indian food. And they taste, ah, oh, this tastes good. I don't know, I should have asked, did it smell good when you first went in? You know, the smell is very different from taste sometimes, like durian. And then they say, oh, this tastes quite good. And say, from then on, I like Indian food more and more, right? They kind of look at the mom and uh, mom said, but we don't cook Indian food. <laughs> But see, that even if it's not there, it's like, I think about it. It can be cultivated. It can be cultivated. It needs to be cultivated. So I asked another younger one, right? Do you like chili? No. Do you like Indian food? No. <laughs> so it's not natural. It's not necessarily natural. It needs to be cultivated. Many things in life are like that. Now, you know, there was a time when I found that I kept eating. And then after eating, I still feel hungry. Always hungry. <laughs> so I was like, yes, yes. No, don't worry, young people, you're growing, right? It's growing, growing age. I'm not at growing age anymore. The only growth is the other way around, right? But so I, I'm at this age, I shouldn't be having this kind of appetite. And then later, as I read up, <clears throat> There is this phenomena, as I understand it, all right? When you eat more, <coughs> your stomach kind of expands. It gets used to being pushed apart, then it becomes bigger. Maybe that's why it comes out as a big stomach, right? So the stomach itself grows bigger. Grows bigger means there is more space inside, correct? More space inside. So, 
When you eat, then you have this feeling that it is not full, because it is not full yet. But when your stomach is smaller, all right, when you s eat less over time, it shrinks, and then it's smaller, so just some food, you kind of feel, you at least sense the fullness faster. But when it's big, your appetite is there, you don't feel that fullness, so you can keep eating, keep eating. Kolinte, uh, is it true? Okay, <laughs> it's true. So, so I read that, ah, okay. Now, when, when I was younger, I was very, very skinny, right? And my parents would say, eat more, eat more. And then they make me eat to, to try and, you know, beef me up. And then when I eat more, yeah, I find that. So now I begin to realize that. Now, you can cultivate your stomach to want more or not want more. I mean, this is just an analogy since God talks about food here. This is not about cook better food at home, right? This, this is this spiritual situation. God using physical things to help us realize the picture. Lots of pictures for us to think about. So, my friends, it does not occur over time. You want a hunger for, for God's Word. You want a hunger for spiritual things. You either develop a hunger for the carnal or the hunger for the spiritual. Now then, pray, pray, Lord, this can't be fixed by me. I will do my part, but Lord, can you please increase this hunger in me? God will answer that prayer. Patiently pray that. Maybe God may take a bit of time to test your sincerity, that by the time you have it, you are very thankful, and you don't want to lose it once it's cultivated. You know, once it's cultivated, it's something that you feel very uncomfortable not having. It's the very opposite. When God says, the hungry, but to the hungry, to the hungry, it's very different. You see the honeycomb, you want it. You see the good things, you want it, to the hungry. I remember when Uncle Bernie, most of you know Uncle Bernie, after he got saved, well, we encouraged him to take FEBC courses. He was already past his 80s, at least, if not 90s, all right? Past his 90s, I think. Now, he would drive all the way from the north for, I think, about half an hour at night, at his age, to attend FEBC courses. Then we held it in, 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 in church. He did not have to operate it at home. He said he wants to come. He came after one semester, he cultivated a desire for God's Word. Now, he's someone who reads everything. He reads tons of all kinds of things. When I visit him, I was I have all kinds of books. Someone who reads a lot. As a prisoner of war, I guess, stuck here. So, he's just finding things to read. So, it became, he cultivated a reading, a learning habit, but on the wrong things. After one semester, so those of you who know him, when it was FEBC holidays time, he was so uncomfortable. It's the opposite, you know. For us, it's uh, enough of God's uh, discomfort already. But he cultivated that desire for spiritual things, for the Word of God. He said to me, Pastor, can we continue FEBC class? I said, sorry, I can't do anything. It's holidays. I can't ask the lecturer to come back and conduct courses. It's holidays. And say, what about all the old courses, all right? So some also suggest that, you know, why don't we screen during school, FEBC holidays, screen the old FEBC classes? So I was scratching my head, say, wow, I wonder if there's any FEBC full-time college student who actually request that. It's holidays. Yay, oh, it's holidays. Can we not have holidays? Can we have more? Can we screen all the old? See, it's cultivated. My friends, it can. If it can happen to Uncle Bernie, it can happen to you. It can happen to you, teenager. Don't give up and say, uh, it's like that. Oh, I'm a teenager. I I'm an elderly. I'm retired. It's like that. Pastor, you don't understand us. No, it, can be it must be cultivated. God says to a hungry soul, means you need to cultivate hunger. But it starts by eating, eating, eating. The stomach gets bigger, bigger, bigger. Your spiritual stomach. So for spiritual realm, you want a big, big spiritual stomach. Cultivate that. Now then, the next C, the solution to cultivating a, a 
spiritual, insatiable spiritual hunger. Now, God says this to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Every bitter thing is sweet. Why not say to the hungry soul, honeycomb is sweet. Every bitter thing. Now we learned about open rebuke. Open rebuke is very often a bitter pill to swallow, isn't it? After open rebuke, now God says, have a hunger also for bitter things. Every, God says every. Now bitter things for us to want to take it. Very often people tell me, bitter God is very good for you. All right, bitter God is very good for you. What is this C? I need to crucify my flesh, <laughs> particularly the tongue, the taste buds. I need to crucify the taste buds to take it. I need to press, I need to um, depress the flesh and say, this is good for me. All right, this is good for me. You know, I always remember this joke as well. Parent was caning the child, and the parent say, holding the rod, says, you got to know, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Then the child turns around and says, well, if hurting me will help me learn, and if, being, if, being, if the one holding the rod will hurt more, then daddy give me the rod. <laughs> I'll cane you. If I cane you, I hurt a lot, then I stop. <laughs> now, that's just a, I thought it was an interesting thought. There is pain. There is pain. The right, point is, there is pain. We must crucify the flesh, the desires that have come in, that now has taken over, that, that makes me want that more than the honeycomb, the good things that I know is good. You have to recognize and say, all right, I have to do something about it. Whatever it is, you go home. All right? If it is teens, some website, even adults, some, some things in your life, even if it is some hobby that has that is not sinful but has taken over your relish for God's things. It's time to crucify the flesh. I don't play this, I don't do this, I won't die. But my soul, if I don't feed my soul, I don't cultivate a desire for it, God says, one day I will begin to loathe these things. I don't want to get to that state. I will start crucifying my flesh now. Teens, what is it? Some things you're having in secret? Daddy and mommy doesn't know about it? It's in your drawer, it's in your computer, it's in your room. What is it? It's with your friends. What is it? Deep in your heart, what is it? Same for the adults. Now we learned yesterday, embrace, uh, the other day, embrace Peter Peel. The hungry soul, God says, appreciates, all right? So this, when you crucify your flesh and you begin to take on what is good, you will begin to appreciate. You know the problem just now we said, right? What causes spiritual satiation is complacency, is familiarity, bliss, contempt. But when you crucify and you replace it, we always say, I will call it replacement theology. Getting rid of one thing is not good enough. You have to replace it. Otherwise, you twiddle your thumb, stop playing computer games, stop playing, stop playing, stop playing. The thumb just keeps going still. You have to replace it with something. Same, the mind. Now, so you will begin to now appreciate bitter God. <laughs> begin to appreciate bitter God. Sharon will say, I hold you to that. <laughs> right, this is uh, quite difficult. But it's good for health, right? So you start. But many things I hate. I hated vegetable. You can hate vegetable, right? Not murder. <laughs> I, I hate vegetable. But come here and I eat, I eat, I eat. So now, before dinner, I ask Sharon, any vegetable tonight? Any vegetable now? Helps the stomach as well. So begin to, now, I crucify that. If I crucify eating less meat, and just say eat less meat, I will replace it with some other unhealthy thing, right? So, crucify the flesh, all right? Now, the hungry soul, and now God says every. Now, every, please remember, God says to the hungry soul, every 
every bitter thing is sweet every not just particular bitter every we must not be Christians that are like that now you want to solve this this problem in your life I think one of the big problems that we have is we are very selective we are very selective with what we accept as a bitter pill this one doesn't hurt me that much doesn't irritate me annoy me that much this one I can give up all right I'll take this bitter pill because it's every bitter thing is sweet there is this embracing of every study with a passion to be hungry Lord I want every kind of doctrine churches as it grows a common phenomena occurs as well not a good thing people get tired of doctrines they get tired of doctrines they want more stories they want more activities they want just applications all right just application uh, skip the doctrine part because it's every you you have to go through the doctrines to get the applications right don't have the shortcut now if i just say i must like vegetable okay vegetable just stuff and stuff and stuff but the more i realize the value of vegetables what it does the more i realize that the foundation now i like it i take it because i realize it's good study asking how everything got everything my family life my singlehood life my student life my working life every area God show me help me now but one of the big problem is this in this every now oh, sorry this C is under comprehensiveness a comprehensiveness is every now one of the common thing that Christians say when you say why is it that you don't come for Bible studies why and the common answer is this and if you have this in your heart in your thinking you may not say it to me but that is your thinking you must solve the problem otherwise you won't have spiritual hunger what is this problem the topics do not meet my needs selective not comprehensive comprehensive means as long as it's there is it on the table I come and eat the topic you know I'm in a stage of life where family life is important where singlehood life is important where um, school life is important I'm at that stage but you know this 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 particular topics or these particular doctrines nothing to do with my stage of life or with my particular problem that I'm facing in life now oh you read the title I, I think I won't come you know I, I'm very bogged down and very troubled by this but this topic doesn't cover it because it is every bitter thing everything bitter means is something that is not so palatable to you because you you want to have something soft that is palatable to you you want a solution you study the word of God because you want a solution but the solution is not, I want a solution to increase my love for God increase my spirituality my growth so that I can be a better witness for God the solution is not that your the solution you're looking for is Lord I got family problem Lord, my child is very naughty how to bring up the child so that it will be not be so naughty not my workplace my boss my colleagues it's a very political environment how to manage my emotions when I go to work we study for solutions to ourselves comprehensiveness is crucial now ask myself some of you know that some of the elderly in our church they never get tired of talking about certain topics the moment that topic comes up or when they bring that topic up there is twinkle in their eye there is um, excitement in their speech you know what it is right no not sleeping oh you don't know I <laughs> don't know in Australia I find that is very common gardening um, cultivating 
come back to cultivating, right? Cultivating fruit trees to the point where some can cultivate new breeds of fruit. Did you know we have people in our midst that are like that? New breed of mangoes, right? That, are, that is a combination of everything that you want in a mango and the seed inside is tiny. All right, so you go find out who this person is. The seed inside is tiny. And this same person, I learned so much about bees, beehive from him. What many things in that are actually very applicable to the Christian life. The depth of knowledge that he has in those areas. I said bees, all right, just have them and let them build that thing and then done. No, there's so many details in there. And anything, any seminar that he can attend, he will attend and listen. But he's already very good at it, very good at cultivating all kinds of fruits. He said, I just, you know, we had a talk. We went for it. Any aspect, as long as it is, has to do with cultivating, he will go. No, say, ah, uh, this one, not about mangoes, don't go. Anything about fruits. We want fruitfulness in our lives. Be interested in everything. Now, that's why they can talk with such sparkle in them. PhD, people who, are, who does PhD, you know, they, they do not get tired of, of researching. They do not get tired of, of finding new things, inventing. They don't get tired of it. I said, you are PhD level, you know. You are already so satiated with knowledge in that field. But they're still hungry for knowledge. Comprehensiveness is crucial, my friend. Now the next C is this. Church life. Church life. Now I'm not talking about the Roman Catholics, alright? You don't come to church, you are not saved. Now God is clear. We are told not to neglect the assembling of ourselves. The cultivation of spiritual desires is something that occurs in the church. I know many of you say, I teach, I teach my children at, at home. We do family worship. Now it's more than that. God said very clearly in Ephesians, when he went to heaven, Christ gave gifts to the church. One of the gifts, pastors and teachers. Why does God give gifts to the church? Why not give, give this to the home? But the chapter is about the church, the body of Christ. Why don't you say, I give that to parents at home? God intends that the church is the place where the feeding, I'm not saying stop feeding at home. Feeding at home is your absolute necessity. But that being done is not comprehensive enough. Parents, please wake up to that. Children, young ones, please know that. God intends for the assembling. There are difficult doctrines, there are details that you need to know that God enables, calls full-time teachers, pastors. Teach them to teach, to feed the congregation. That is what it is. We have for the Holy Spirit, we all know. That's the case then, God do not need to do all this for the church. Now many of you think that, and I'm thankful that the Lord led that in some of the messages. But church, come, serve. You got to serve. It's part of your witness on earth, part of your life on earth, part of your watching on earth. It happens in the church, but I evangelize, evangelize with the church, but I pray. God calls the church the house of prayer. So if you still have the concept, church is an appendix, it's not necessary. You must awaken, you must realize it's not comprehensive what I'm doing. It's good, but it's not comprehensive, it's not enough. You know, many of you say, I want to bring up godly seed and it fills my heart. Because really that is the reason why God, God gives you seed to make them godly. But, but homes and young people in the homes realize this. Now, father, mother, 
Mothers, if you say, I want to bring up godly seed, but you do not bring them to church, where they will be part of the covenantal family. You bring them for infant baptism. You make the vow that you make them part of God's people. But then you do not bring them to be with God's people. They will grow up. You say, I want to bring up godly seed, right? But you don't bring them to, to be with godly people. They will grow up with the people of the world. You come once a week with them. I go to church, right? You must realize it's not comprehensive. You want to cultivate in them a desire for spiritual things? Even three days, four days that we have in church is barely enough. And you only think Sunday is enough? We studied in our family seminar, whatever the parents' sin is, in the next generation, your children, they will sin worse than you. That very same sin. You come once a week, don't go old and wonder why are they no longer in church. Because you let them cultivate desires, appetites for the things of the world, for the friends of the world. Don't say, I want to bring up godly seed and miss this point. Now, I'm not saying that they come to church, they'll be safe. I'm not saying that they come to church, they will be good. But that is what is minimum that you need to do as well. Now, when you say you want to bring up godly seed and they look at your lives, there's no comprehensiveness in that. You do minimum. Attend church, minimum. You don't bring them for Bible studies. Do you think they will think that the appetite I need to develop is God's Word? No. The appetite I need to develop is stay at home, watch TV, sleep, do work, that kind of thing. That is what you're cultivating in them. You can say everything to them, but you can no longer say, I want, I'm bringing up godly seed. They may know the Bible stories. They may know how to pray. They may know all that. But when they grow up, they'll be different. You know, many of the elderly here, after many years of hearing what they should be, they should have been, many of them tell me this. Sometimes after a certain message, they say, Pastor, I, I really wish they speak to me in Mandarin. I did all these things when I was young. Now I plead with my children to come to church. I said, didn't they come to church when they were young? They, yeah, they, they came with me. But I came once a week. The rest of the time, I thought that was enough. I thought that was enough. And I tell them Bible stories. I thought that was enough. It's not comprehensive. As they grew up, the children have already developed so many appetites that they needed to have developed a different kind of appetites with the church, with the church people, with the church children, all gone. You cannot say, I want to bring up Godly seed and ignore church life. Remember that. Why do you think it's often preached on the pulpit in churches in this main theme? Be part of all these activities. You know, if Alex never brought the family to the Indian restaurant, the children at least one of them will not have developed a taste, a desire, a yearning, a craving for Indian food. Come to church, whatever topic it is, everything in there is precept upon precept. We did that in our, D in our DHW. So it builds, it builds, it builds. Your love, your appetite, your desire for spiritual things is not solved by, I have this problem, please, I attend this, it's solved. You know what will happen? You hear that all the time, right? Once the problem is solved, not interested anymore, right? So if I eat bitter God just because of something, the moment that problem is solved in my health, forget about bitter God. But all the other usefulness of bitter God is still there, right? So don't study God's Word just to solve your own problem. Now ultimately, the last C is this. Pursue Christ. Again, we have been reminded in this series many times, the hallmark, the hallmark of the Christian faith 
the Christian watching is Christ. It's all about Christ. Young teenagers, if you come to church because of daddy mommy, adults, you come to church because you feel you need to keep up with appearances. You will only, as we've been reminded again and again, last so long. But when it is Christ, there's no end. When we say Christ, you say, oh, so where is Christ? I come in. Christ is not here, right? I go home. When we say pursue Christ, your pursuit is Christ. Is where do you find Christ? Today, in the Word. In fact, the word <coughs> honeycomb is often in Proverbs used to refer to the Word of God. The Word of God. Pursue, read, study. We sung just now, Thy Word is like a garden Lord. It's a deep, deep mind. If your pursuit is Christ, the Word of God never satiates you. It's a deep mind. Everything you learn, everything you hear, you desire more of that. It must be about Christ, nothing else. It's bottomless. May God help us to learn to cultivate this hunger. Let us pray.